Good evening and welcome to our second annual Big Science Pitch. I'm Associate Professor Jen Martin and I founded and lead the Science Communication Teaching Program here at the University of Melbourne and I'm also Dr Jen on 3RRR. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where I am this evening, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of our land and waterways for many, many thousands of years. And of course, they were our first scientists and our first storytellers. So I pay my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, both past and present. And of course, I welcome all First Nations people joining us this evening. So how exciting is it to be here? It takes me back to this time last year when I was uh, sitting at my desk in my study at home and there was a ginormous thunderstorm going on on the night of our inaugural big science pitch and I was absolutely terrified every time the thunder and lightning struck thinking that I was about to lose power to my house and it was going to be a complete and utter disaster. Thankfully that didn't happen and I'm very confident that it also isn't going to happen this evening. What I am very confident about is that we are going to have an absolutely fantastic time together tonight. So let me explain to you how the big science pitch works. Essentially, as I said, it's an annual event where five of our leading early career researchers get the opportunity to pitch in only three minutes a research project that they want to be working on. And they're pitching in order to win a share of $100,000 donated to the Native Australian Animals Trust. Now, as you can imagine, we have lots of incredible researchers here in the Faculty of Science at Melbourne University. And so the five that you are going to hear from tonight have already been through a rigorous selection process. You are hearing from the cream of the crop. And each of them receives $10,000 towards their research for having been shortlisted and for having the opportunity to pitch their research to us this evening. Then our esteemed judging panel, who you're gonna to get to meet in just a little while, are gonna to have to put their heads together and decide who is gonna win first, second and third place. And all of those researchers will receive additional funds towards their research. But wait, there is still more. We have two other wonderful prizes that we are going to have the pleasure of awarding this evening. The first of those is a prize of $10,000 and that's going to be judged by the one and only Tim Winton, beloved Australian author, and he is the patron of the, Austra of the Native Australian Animal Trust. And I'm also very excited to let you know that Tim has generously sent us 12 signed copies of some of his most popular books. Here is one I had the pleasure of uh, being handed earlier. And so please check the chat uh, to work out or to find out exactly how we're going to be deciding those winners of our books. Then the last prize this evening is the one that you get to have a say in, you get to decide, and that is the People's Choice Award. So I will let you know when the time has come for you to cast your vote for the People's Choice Award. Obviously, you need to hear from all of the pitchers before you can cast your vote. But please do keep an eye on the chat throughout the evening because there'll be all sorts of information in there for you, including the link for you to vote for the People's Choice Award. So I think it is time to get this show underway. I'm very excited to hear from our first pitcher, who is Jinyu Gu. And Jinyu has loved animals from the time that she was a very small girl and she traveled from Austra to Australia from China in order to do research to contribute to a better environment. She's the mum of two boys and very passionate about healthy food and food safety. And Jinyu is going to tell us about her project, Fighting Insect Pests with Bacteria. Do you enjoy gardening? I bet we have some green thumbs in the audience. If you do spend any time in garden, I'm sure you'll notice these little bugs. They are aphids. They eat your plant, and they are really hard to get rid of. 
efforts are bad for the plant. And at the moment, the only option we have for controlling them is with nasty pesticides. But pesticides are bad for the environment, and not sort of the chemicals I want to eat in on my food. So I'm working on an environmentally friendly way to control aphids. As you can see, aphids are so tiny, you may not even notice them arrive. But after a few weeks, you will see hundreds of them on your plant. How do they multiply so fast? Because they can clone themselves. Because of the fastest speed they reproduce and the hundreds of aphids on your plant, the nature predators don't stand much of a chance to fight them. Aphids are not just the problem for your veggies and the rose bushes. They could transfer virus when feed on the plant and cause great damage to crops. In fact, aphids cost Australia millions of dollars every year. Even the pesticides we will always rely on are not good enough for controlling aphids because they become resistant to it. But in the meantime, pesticides enter the environment and kill other animals. This is exactly why I do my research. When I was a kid, I cried for those animals being hurt or killed by pesticides. So, how can we control aphids without pesticides? The solution is even much smaller than aphids themselves. Bacteria. I'm going to find bacteria in other insects and transfer them to aphids. The bacteria will change aphids' behavior. Seems like making them produce less, or changing their performance to certain plant. The coolest thing about my research is totally environmental friendly and pose no risk to other animals, and it is not just for aphids. My research could apply for other insects pests too. So. If you care about nature and our food safety, please vote for me and help me fight with these bugs. Brilliant job, Jinyu! Thank you so much. I definitely care about nature. So we have the opportunity to chat for a couple of minutes. We've got questions coming in in the chat from our audience, but I'm actually going to begin with a question for you from the judges. And the question is, how will the bacteria that you use spread within the aphid population? Do you have to infect just a few individuals or a lot of individuals? Oh, that's actually a very great question, <laughs> and this is also the question we really care about.、Uh, if you want to release the aphids,、uh, actually there are two ways that aphids can spread the bacteria. First. Because the mom clone themselves, so the offspring will bring the bacteria. And the second way is there is some、um, some others friend could help, like the <laughs> plant. The bacteria may enter the plant tissue and transfer to other aphids, which, based on our、uh, experiment, that it the transfer can be happen very quick,、mm -hmm. like in two to three weeks. And also, the wasps, which parasitize the aphids, could help as well. So when it parasitize the aphids carrying the bacteria, and it will、um, parasitize another one, which will transfer the bacteria as well. So there are multiple ways that we can make this、um, methods work. So this is like the fantastic part and interesting part of my research. Yeah, it sounds like there are lots of things going for this for this system that you're devising. Okay, I've got a question that's come in、um, on the chat from Nick Robinson, and Nick would like to know how do we ensure that the bacteria don't affect other insects?、Um, this is like a very very good and interesting question. 
and uh, uh, I think this is um, something we would like to test in the future as well. Mm -hmm. But um, if it's carrying the, uh, I mean, we would like to find the uh, bacteria into the similar species, which means if the species are quite distant, like the bees, like the uh, the other insects, they may not get the bacteria. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, of like human get infection from human and like similar animals, but mm -hmm. they cannot get infected from the plant or like yeah. the other um the other things. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the other insects, as long as they're not very closely related to aphids, the other insects should be should yeah. be fine. Yeah, should be fine. Okay, excellent. Okay, I've got a question for you from Daniel Check. Thank you, Daniel. Which bacteria are used to control their reproduction? Uh, actually, this is like a very um, academic question that we would like to explain because after the trans infection, you will find the bacteria will change the uh, FS behavior into different ways, mm -hmm. such like reduce the reproduction. And we did find one bacteria called the uh, Rickettsiella, which is like a very complicated name, but it can reduce the, the fecundity to uh, 50%. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which means that uh, we could uh, tell based on the host performance compared to like the, the host that carried the endocebal, uh, the bacteria to the field population, whether this bacteria can decrease the fecundity in its host and then we could transfer it to see whether this trait still ke uh, keep into the our new efforts. Mm, fascinating. Okay, I have one more question for you, and that is, how do you decide what insects to screen for useful bacteria? Oh, I feel surprised that the audience found the interesting <laughs> question that we would like to explore. Um, Actually, just like uh, what I said before, that we want to find the close related uh, insects, mm -hmm. which um, similar, I mean, which close to aphids. So there is like a big chance you can get the trans infection successful. Mm -hmm. And also um, maybe for our um, next step, we would like to um, test uh, the different bacteria into different host. I mean, uh, even the, insects are not close enough, but if the bacteria is interesting enough, like it causes different um, traits, we will plan to use it to have it to have a go. Fantastic, Jingyi. Thank you so much. We clearly have an incredibly intelligent uh, audience joining us this evening. So yeah. many great questions. <laughs> So thank you, that's all of the questions that we have time for, but thank you also to our audience for your questions. That was absolutely fantastic. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our second picture to you for the evening, and that is Justin Mayer. Now I have it on good authority that Justin owns 52 houseplants. I'm guessing he counted very carefully to give us that number. But that when he's not out shopping for new plants, he's either baking cheesecakes or lemon meringue pies, or that he's out looking for the best donut shop in Melbourne. And he's very keen to have your recommendations. So please put those in the chat too. But tonight, Justin is here to ask whether bacterial probiotics can save coral reefs from climate change. Don't you wish you were here right now, snorkeling in the warm waters of the Great Barrier Reef? But as you probably know, coral reefs aren't doing that well at the moment, and most of them actually look a lot more like this. This is the result of climate change, and specifically ocean warming. I want to help corals survive in this warmer climate, and I'm going to make bacteria do all the work. When they're healthy, Coral reefs are teeming with life. They house more than a quarter of all marine species. They provide us with food, and they're a great place for a holiday. If we zoom in on a healthy coral, this is what their tissues look like. And all the bright dots you can see are actually tiny algae that live inside the coral tissues. 
Just like plants, these algae use the sunlight to photosynthesize and produce energy that they pass on to their coral host. This relationship is essential for coral survival and is the foundation of coral reefs. But if the water gets a little too hot, these algae start to malfunction and produce harmful chemicals that can damage the coral. In response, the coral gets rid of the algae. This is coral bleaching. It leads to coral starvation and death, and coral reefs lose their life and color. Since 2016, more than 90% of the Great Barrier Reef has suffered coral bleaching because of marine heat waves, and half of its corals have died. But what if we could use bacteria to help corals cope with heat? Just like the probiotic bacteria in the yogurt that you might have had for breakfast to improve your gut health, I want to give corals a specific kind of yogurt filled with bacteria that will help them fight off coral bleaching. To do this, I'm going to use bacteria that already live inside coral tissues, and I will train them in the lab, teach them some new tricks so that they can help corals survive at higher temperatures. I will expose hundreds of generations of bacteria to the toxic chemicals released by the algae that cause coral bleaching in the first place. This will force the bacteria to adapt to this toxic environment and develop ways to efficiently break down the chemicals released by the algae. If it works, then we could feed these bacteria to the corals and they could clean up the mess made by algae during marine heat waves. This would prevent coral bleaching and coral death. Now, training bacteria may sound like a crazy idea, but I hope to give corals a little push so that they can tolerate the warmer temperatures of the future while we work out how to deal with climate change itself. Coral reefs are magical ecosystems that are rapidly dying, and they need every little bit of help they can get even if it is as small as a bacteria. So please vote for me and help me to help you have a fabulous holiday in a healthy Great Barrier Reef. Uh, thank you, Justin. I would very much like to be snorkeling there right now. Thank you. So let's find out how we can make sure that that is possible for all of our audience. So I'd like to begin with what I think is a really important question. And that is that if half of the corals have already died in the past couple of years, it really sounds like we don't have very much time. So how quickly do you think that you can get these bacteria to adapt and, and avoid bleaching? Yeah, that's a very important question. We actually have a very recent modelling that in which we're pretty confident that by 2035, environmental conditions will be unsuitable for most coral reefs on Earth. So we have very, soon. very few years to act. Um, so, you know, it's, especially in Australia, it's quite, um, it's a thorough, very thorough process to get these um, interventions out on the field um, approved. So it does take several years. Um, we are going as fast as we can, but of course we have to follow that very thorough process and make sure it works and it's safe. Um, but realistically, in, in a matter of a few years, um, it is something that we could achieve. Uh, bacteria are quite easy to work with. They evolve very quickly as well. So um, yeah, I think in, in a matter of a few years, it's something that could be achieved. So we're hearing about the power of bacteria again, which is wonderful. Okay, we have a question from the audience, and that is, is it just toxins produced by corals that will affect bacteria, or will temperature extremes also be important? Yeah, that is also an excellent question. So. Um, during the process of coral bleaching, it is mostly the toxins that negatively affect the coral cells and the algal cells. Um, so we do know that the, um, the, 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 the bacterial communities that associate with corals can change with temperature. So we are hoping to find those bacteria that will be able to deal with both, with both higher temperatures, but also the toxins um, released during coral bleaching. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we have a question from Helene Hansen. If these bacteria work, how could they be delivered at a big enough scale to make a difference? That is the key question, <laughs> isn't it? And that is something that we're actively working on because obviously um, the Great Barrier Reef is absolutely massive. It's the size of Italy, which is huge. Um, so we can't just take a tub of yogurt and then go and sprinkle <laughs> yogurt on the reef every, every other week. That would be a lot of yogurt. Um, so we, we need to find ways a, to, have, to, to make the delivery efficient, but also to make sure that those bacteria um, stay in the long term in the coral. So that's something that we're working on, trying to find the bacteria that will 
colonize those uh, corals long term, but also spread throughout coral populations more easily. So that's something that um, Jin, you just touched on as well, the, the modes of transmission of those bacteria. So we need to make sure that they can spread as easily and quickly as possible so that we don't have to go and deliver this yogurt every other week <laughs> during summer because that would be not really Just feasible. you with a tub of yogurt <laughs> and a little spoon getting really quite tired out there. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, we have another question from the audience. Can we also train the coral and the algae to adapt to changing climate? Absolutely. In theory, yes. Um, so corals are a little bit tricky because they grow so slowly. Mm -hmm. They grow very slowly. They have um, a generation time that is also quite long. So the time it takes them to produce new offspring is often, is often several years. Mm -hmm. So that's how long it will take them to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, the algae, we are actually doing this already in the lab, um, but in the same way as that, that the coral is, is quite slow to adapt, the algae are still slower than bacteria. Mm -hmm. So we have been doing, uh, doing this in the lab for about the past 10 years and it is looking promising um, so this is also a, an approach that we're looking into yeah fantastic all right we have time for one more question oh there's so many questions which one do i choose thank you to all of our audience for so many wonderful questions um, how about which coral reef or region might this technique be applied to first i think we'll probably start with australia because it is where we have the most, the biggest and the most amazing coral reefs with the Great Barrier Reef. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, as I said, the, the, the process is in Australia to, 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 to get those, um, those methods started in the field are very thorough and, um, and lengthy, but um, I think it's worth it because the Great Barrier Reef is you know, absolutely amazing. So if we can do something to save this one first, I think, um, yeah, that'll be good. A good start. Absolutely. Well, thank you on behalf of everybody uh, watching who is definitely hoping that one day they will get to have a wonderful holiday and go snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef again. Thank you. Fascinating. Well, what a start to the big science pitch for 2022. Thank you so much to Jinyu and Justin for kicking us off with a bang. But now I think it's time that you need to meet our judges. So chairing our judging panel tonight, I'm really delighted to welcome Professor Moira O'Brien, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Science here at the University of Melbourne. Now, as a researcher, Moira is a reproductive biologist interested in male infertility, with a particular interest in sperm development and function. And she heads a large and multidisciplinary, big collaborative research program spanning, spanning fundamental research through to clinical medicine. And then in addition, as the Dean of Science, she's in charge of a large and successful faculty, which includes um, physics and chemistry and life and ecological sciences, mathematics, the geosciences and human geography. She's also the custodial dean for the Bio21 Institute, the Melbourne Energy Institute, and the Indigenous, not Indigenous Knowledge Institute. She's got a lot on her plate, so we are really thrilled that she's able to be here with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming Professor Moira O'Brien. Thanks, Jen. Um, good evening to everyone. Thanks for joining us. I do indeed have the pleasure of being the Dean of Science here at the University of Melbourne. So thanks to both Jingyu and Justin for their impressive pitches. It's been a great start to the evening and you both set the bar very high for your colleagues to follow, so well done. As you know, there's $100,000 up for grabs tonight. These prizes are generously funded by the Native Australian Animals Trust and through the Robert Johansson and Anne, Anne Swan funds. The Native Australian Animals Trust is a way for people who are passionate about Australian wildlife and their environments to connect with and support the University of Melbourne researchers, teaching and engagement activities. Australia has unique and precious landscapes and our flora and fauna are some of the most beautiful in the world. Our animals require careful custodianship and unique approaches to their conservation. It's our responsibility to protect and preserve our natural environments. 
it is for these reasons that we established the Native Australian Animals Trust. The Trust supports work on Australian animals and their environments with two broad purposes – to learn from Australian animals to improve their conservation and to tap into their fundamental secrets in their biology to improve our own lives. Thanks to our generous donors, the Trust helps fund our students and researchers to advance important environmental and ecological projects. Today's winners will be decided by the judging panel and you'll all have a say in the People's Choice Award and voting will commence once we've heard from all of the pitchers. I have the honour of being one of the judges tonight, which I know will not be an easy task. But I'm joined by three other talented experts who are delighted, who are expert in the preservation of our environment and our native species. It is my pleasure to introduce our fellow judges. The first is Dr. Ileana Mendina Guzman. She is an evolutionary biologist from the School of Biosciences here at the University of Melbourne. Ileana knows a thing or two about what our presenters are going through tonight. At last year's inaugural Big Science Pitch, Ileana was awarded joint first place and also took out the People's Choice Award for her project on why are birds so good at building nests. You'll hear from Ileana a little later about how winning last year's Big Science Pitch has helped her work. Next, we have Andrew Kelly. Andrew is the convener of the Waterways Network and a member of the Australian Environmental Grant Makers Network. Until late last year, he was the Yarra River Keeper and successfully advocated for the Yarra River Protection Act and for better protection of rivers through changing the planning schemes. He has degrees in both natural resource management and archaeology and remains active in advocating for waterways in Victoria and beyond. And finally, I welcome Russell Wilson, CEO, friend and great supporter of the university. He is the, he is the founder of Australia's largest cryptocurrency exchange. Russ and his family are great friends to the university and are passionate supporters of marsupial conservation, including through their support of the Thylacine Integrated Genomics Restoration and Research Lab, the Tiger Lab. Thank you to our judges uh, for taking the time to be here tonight. Our challenge to assess the pitches on innovation, delivery and impact. And after seeing the first two, we have a tough job to do. Back to you, Jen, to introduce the remaining researchers. Thank you, Moira, and enormous thank you to Ileana and Russ and Andrew. We're so happy that you're here with us this evening, and I'm so happy that it's your job to work out who the winners are going to be and not my job. So the time has come for us to welcome our third pitcher for the evening, and that is Ellen Cottingham. And I've known Ellen for a while, um, but I learnt something brand new about her while preparing for this event tonight. And that is that she was once an extra on the TV show Neighbours, but she kept getting into trouble with the showrunners because she kept tripping over electrical cables. I'm very confident she won't trip over any electrical cables this evening. But Ellen would like to talk to us tonight about a very smooth operator in her pitch about the genetic biocontrol of smooth newts. Invasive species. I don't think there's any other community in the world that understands invasive species better than Australians. Who could forget the disastrous consequences of the cane toad introduction of the 1930s, or of rabbits, foxes, or cats? But how many of you have heard of the smooth newt? Well, up until a few months ago, I really had no idea what they were. Smooth newts look somewhere between an aquatic lizard and a frog, similar to salamanders. We don't get newts in Australia until recently. Melbourne is now ground zero for an invasion of newts that established after escaping from the pet trade. Smooth newts had actually been on the Australian biosecurity hit list for some time because of their projected ability to occupy all across of southern Australia, basically all of these regions shown in red and yellow. 
Smooth newts cannot be allowed to spread to these areas as they will compete with our native species for food and habitat, damage our creeks and rivers and spread diseases to our native amphibians. Could the smooth newt be the next cane toad? I don't think any of us want to find that out. The smooth newt population is small right now, but it is growing fast. We need to do something soon to stop this population before it gets away from us and becomes truly unmanageable. But how do we go about removing a species like the smooth newt? Well, we might try to physically remove them, but they are hard to find. So this is time consuming, reasonably ineffective and can impact our native species. What we need is a management tool for smooth newts that has a few key features. One, a way of targeting smooth newts directly without harming our native species. Two, something that will make female newts say have fewer young or only produce male offspring so that the population declines. And three, something that spreads quickly through the newt population. This may sound like a crazy wish list, but I'm excited to tell you that I'm already developing a tool just like this here in Melbourne. It's a form of genetic biocontrol called gene drive. In normal inheritance, offspring have a 50-50 chance of inheriting, let's say, a green gene from a parent, as you can see in this family tree. But if one of the parent carries a gene drive, and let's also say that that's a gene drive that only allows for male offspring to be born, then all of the young will inherit the gene drive and essentially breed themselves to extinction. This is how we remove a species like the smooth newt. The beauty of using a gene drive is that it's spread only by breeding. In a place like Australia, where all of our native wildlife are so unique, this means that the only species affected by a gene drive are the invasive species we choose to target. A smooth newt cannot mate with any Australian species, so none of our species can be harmed. Gene drives are not just a tool for smooth newts. I am also developing gene drives to some of Australia's more established introduced species like foxes, rabbits, and of course our favourite, the cane toad. Gene drives could be the most effective tool ever developed for invasive species and smooth newts are a perfect test case. If you believe that this is a tool that I should keep developing, then please vote for me. Wow, Ellen, I'm guessing a lot of people in the audience are thinking, yes, please, we would like you to keep developing that. Um, my first question for you is that if these newts had been identified as a biosecurity risk, why were they being sold in Melbourne aquarium shops? Yeah, so this is this is the thing. They were being sold um, as part of this sort of exotic um, pet trade for several years. And then I think they popped up on the radar because of, you know, several features, you know, uh, that are often on that watch list. So where they can occupy, if they have a really generalized diet. And so I think once they had, you know, our, our people had an idea that smooth newts were a problem, they put a ban on them. Yeah. But it seems, unfortunately, that someone has likely, not confirmed, but likely has um, released their smooth newt and it's now spreading and it's spreading fast. Yeah. So here we are. Yeah. I mean, they're very striking. I can see that they're an appealing know, pet. They're beautiful. I, they're but... beautiful. <laughs> and then as invasive species go, I mean, we're often having, you know, the cane toads and the carp and they're not the prettiest, but <laughs> smooth newts are beautiful. But unfortunately, they have they pose a real threat mm. to our wildlife and our ecosystems. Big mm, threat. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have a question from Darren Rapsey. Um, how prevalent are the newts at the moment and what effect are they currently having? Mm -hmm. Yes. So at the moment, they're localised. Uh, so they're they're in a particular area in Melbourne and so far they haven't been spreading um, s that quickly out of that range. The reason being, we think, is that there hasn't been much flooding. But as we all know, over the last few weeks, this is changing. So at the moment, their, their impact is relatively small because it's felt in an urbanised area. Um, but they are... Um, vectors of well they basically um, transmit this fungal infection called chytrid and chytrid is just decimating amphibians everywhere including Australia we've already lost six species to chytrid uh, now newts are you know have some resistance to chytrid they're not as affected as our natives and they are carrying this um, fungus at the moment so they're competing at the moment um, in the area they are uh, with our native species for resources and they're also spreading this fungus so they cannot be allowed to get further yeah. Wow. So it sounds like this is quite urgent to stop it them is. in their tracks, it, especially all the rain. That's that we're right. Having. That's right. So we need to get on top of it fast and we need a way to deal with the next newt to come along or the next mm. species that comes along, something we can um, we can implement rapidly that's going to be highly effective. And as I said, not impact our invasive our native species in the process. Mm. 
Yeah. 100%. Okay, I've got a question from Anth Bokshal. Thank you, Anth. Are smooth newts a problem in other countries? And if we develop it, will we be able to export this technology? Yes. So smooth newts are endemic. The newt that we're talking about here in Melbourne is actually endemic to parts of Europe. Actually, newts are not really a problem elsewhere. When I spoke to researchers uh, preparing for this newt project, to researchers around the world, they were astounded that we had too many newts because they have falling populations everywhere else in the world um, because of habitat decline and climate change and all of these things we talk about. So at the moment, I don't believe I'm aware of any newt species that are posing an invasive species risk elsewhere, uh, but that's not to say that they couldn't. Yeah. Important to know. Okay, Ellen, I've got a question for you from John Morangello. Thank you, John. What are the main challenges that you face in developing the gene drive? Yes, yeah, so there's two uh, two pillars that we find uh, challenging when we talk about something like a gene drive. Uh, the first is, of course, the science is totally novel and it hasn't been done before. We have had success with gene drive in insects, which has been fantastic, uh, but not so much in other species yet. So the development of the technology is challenging. Uh, and it's at it, the moment, it always feels like, you know, the two steps forward, one step back. The second, I guess, pillar that is proving to be, and I'm sure will continue to be just as challenging, is managing the social perceptions, the ethical um, questions, the dilemmas, the even the regulation of things like this, these sorts of technology. And I think it's important for all of us in the uh, development of these new invasive species technologies to um, put just as much input into making sure we communicate really effectively and responsibly with the public and with the community about the technology, just as much effort we put into are the actual developing the technology, if that makes sense. You know that I'm going to 100% agree with you yes. on that one, Ellen. Yep. The communication is just so, so yes. important. Okay, we have time for one more okay. question. And this is from Malcolm, okay. who is nine years old. Okay. And Malcolm would like to know, do you know enough about the population dynamics of this species to know if the gene drive needs to be introduced to one or to many populations to work? What a question My from a goodness. nine year old. I don't think I asked questions like that when I was Good nine. Thank you, you Malcolm. Malcolm. That's amazing. <laughs> um, that is just a spectacular question. So at the moment, we'll need to figure out um, population dynamics is the key phrase here. We'll need to figure out how connected the populations are, exactly how many, how effective our gene drive is. These are sort of the three main things. Um, and then based on that information, we give that over to often our population modelers, um, and they will tell us uh, where to implement the gene drive and how many uh, newts need to be carrying the gene drive to be effective. So at the moment, we don't have that information, but um, over the next few years, we'll certainly be uh, looking into it. Fantastic, Ellen. Thank you for this amazing work. And I feel yeah. like we should immediately encourage Malcolm to come and study science. <laughs> I'm know. sure Maria would agree. I know. Come and study Incredible. science with us at Melbourne Uni. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fantastic. Incredible. Fantastic yep. work and fantastic questions from our audience. Thank you. It is time to move on to hear from our next pitcher, who is Cheek Wang. And Cheek studies how insects smell, which is an important field and actually won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2004. And Cheek's interested in the smells that make people happy. And he's actually worked with a local Melbourne distillery to make gin using the alarm pheromone of the ants that he studies very cool and apparently also one of their best-selling gins now. But Cheek is also a fire chaser and this evening he would like to tell us about chasing bushfires in order to understand how smoke affects insects. I'm sure many of you remember the shocking bushfires a couple of summers ago when all of Victoria was covered by smoke for weeks. Many people died, thousands of homes were destroyed, and images like this reminded us how many animals like koalas and kangaroos suffered too. But have you ever considered that bushfires might also be a terrible for insects? It's easy to imagine, as insects can fly, they can just fly away from the fire. Well, it's not that simple. 
To help you understand why bush fowls are so bad for insects, I need to tell you a bit about how they communicate. Insects are incredibly good at communicating with each other over long distances. For example, a male moth with the body length of about only two centimeters can detect chemical signals from a female kilometers away. It's the equivalent of me standing here and hearing my mom yelling at me from Bendigo. Insects use chemicals to convey many of the important messages, like this food over here, come and join the party, or go away, this spot is taken, or come and find me, I'm mature and looking for a handsome mate. So what's all this got to do with the bushfires? Well, insects use their antennae to pick up these chemical messages. Just look how beautiful they are. Insect antennae are stunning, but they're also sensitive, delicate, and fragile. When I looked at the insects that were exposed to Victorian bushfires, their antennae were dirty, really dirty. These insects may have survived the fire, but they did not escape from the smoke. These close-up images show you the dirt from bushfire smoke that covered the antennae of a fly and a bee. And this dirt is going to be a huge problem for them. As most insects depend on having clean antennae to be able to communicate and to perceive the world around them. I'm going to explore how bushfire smoke influence the function of these insect antennae. For example, does it impact their ability to find food or mates? Is it more of a problem for some insects than others? Can we protect our bees from this impact? It's not just a problem in Victoria or even Australia. Hotter and drier summers caused by climate change means that bushfires are becoming more common and more intense in many parts of the world. Obviously, I can't afford jet-setting around the world wherever bushfires are burning, but Victoria is one of the best places in the world for this work because Parks Victoria carries out planned burns every year to prevent large-scale bushfires. This means I can just go wherever Parks Victoria goes and I can collect insect samples in all sorts of different habitats. I go wherever there are fires. My work will help us to understand what bushfire does to insects. When you consider how important insects are to our ecosystem, or when it comes to pollinating our food. If you like my pitch, don't forget to vote for me. Every vote will help me to understand a bit more about this question. Thank you so much, Cheek. I'm just picturing how extraordinary it would be if you could hear your mum calling you from Bendigo right now, especially if you were the size of an insect. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. So I would like to begin uh, with a question for you from the judges. And that is that how long do these antenna, antennae tend to stay dirty? And can the insects clean them themselves? Ah, okay. Yeah, so we just had a um, paper submitted and um, oh, that's actually the question one of the referees asked us. Ah, so <laughs> clever judges, clever, clever judges. referees. <laughs> referees. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, um, so insects have um, uh, multiple mechanisms to clean themselves. Sometimes you see a fly brushing themselves like that. Mm -hmm. So they have a special um, uh, setae on their um, legs to brush themselves. But these um, setae are usually really big, thick, and uh, the gaps are very wide. So just imagine that you're brushing your hair with, um, um, you got some dirt on, the, on, the, on your hair and brushing your hair with a, uh, with a brush. It's not going to remove all of the dirt. You have to mm -hmm. kind of wash them. And um, we have some data to show that um, um, 
for the lifespan of the uh, flies, um, these dirt will be there permanently. Wow. Yeah. So after after four, uh, about two weeks, that's basically the lifespan of a adult flies. Mm -hmm. The nothing's changed. They're just there wow. permanently. So they're so stuck with it. Yeah, they're stuck with it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We have a question for you from uh, our audience member, Kathy Campbell. Mm. Do you think that air pollution generally, and not just bushfire smoke, might be partially responsible for the global decline in insects? Yes. Oh, okay. We have very <laughs> clever <laughs> um, audiences, and um, it's actually another big part of this uh, project. Um, we're thinking about um, um, think about uh, uh, particular, ma particular matter pollutions, or the phrase that you probably have heard um, multiple times, uh, PM, PM 2.5, PM 10, mm -hmm. that sort of question from um, various um, um, countries. For example, the um, um, lots of Asian countries would have this um, um, problem. And um, um, yes, um, we found that um, these particular matter pollutions, um, they're carrying um, some very potent um, um, environmental toxins, uh, toxins, for example, um, um, heavy metals, uh, when they got, got attached to the insect's antenna, they're going to um, also cause lots of um, um, problems for their functions. That, that's, that, yes, yes, um, they, they will. And um, uh, we're endeavored to um, explore this, these questions in the fu near future. Mm, so insects are doing it very tough. Yes, yes. Okay, I, there's a comment uh, in the chat that you could come to the Northern Territory where there's massive burning every year. So there you go, invitation to travel. All right. Um, but I've got a question for you. Thank you again to John Morangello for a question. Do insects living in environments prone to bushfires have in general simpler antennae than those living in other environments? So have they evolved to have simpler antennae that might I don't know, it'd be more easy to clean perhaps or get less dirty? Mm. Um, okay, um, so we haven't actually explored um, this side of the question, but um, um, the population composition of insects in different environments that mostly can, um, are um, controlled by many other aspects of the, uh, for example, their food supply, the prey, um, predators, um, and uh, the uh, very um, uh, smaller environments. So, uh, and probably not uh, fire is probably at least before fire is um, not a big um, problem, a big um, uh, element to that controls their distribution. So um, I wouldn't think this um, evolution has time to kick in to um, to modify these uh, the populations at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So there's other other, other things driving other things driving their evolution. distribution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's why um, a fire has been a surprise. It's, it's attacking this mm -hmm. these insects uh, by surprise. So, yeah. sort of like that. Well, it's good that you've come along at the right time to help us understand that a little bit more. Okay, we have time for one more question, and that is from Melissa Edwards. Which insects are actually most impacted by smoke? Do we know that? Ah, okay. So we're doing some comparisons at the moment, and uh, we found that usually insects and antenna with um, uh, more compli complex um, surface structure are more prone to these uh, kind of um, pollution. Mm -hmm. um, so um, to do this, we did um, some um, aerodynamic uh, simulation as well as um, um, electron antennagram recording. Uh, we found that um, um, flies and bees are one of the most uh, vulnerable insects, mm -hmm. whereas um, a moss um, because their antenna are protected by those sm small scales, mm -hmm. um, are um, safer in this uh, area, in this uh, um, impact. Wow. Mm. Fascinating, Cheek. Yes. Thank you so much. Really, really interesting work. Thank and you. I'm guessing you might get a few more invitations to travel to places where there are bushfires to go and uh, study insects. Yes. 
So thank you to all of our audience members for your questions. And I do just have a quick comment that I would like to share from one of our audience members, which I thought was lovely. And that was how wonderful that all of these researchers from around the world are studying Australian problems, critical Australian problems. And this audience member has commented that they're feeling very special about that. And I would heartily agree. All right, it is time to hear from our final pitcher for this evening, Emily Fobert. And before becoming a marine biologist, Emily actually worked as a science journalist, but she was so inspired by the scientists that she was interviewing that she decided, in fact, she wanted to leave her journalism career and follow her passion for the ocean. Um, and I'm sure in a moment you're going to agree, we're very glad that she did that. And Emily would like to know whether underwater soundscapes can be used to monitor marine restoration success. Most of us wouldn't naturally think of the ocean as a particularly noisy place, but much like a forest on land, Reefs have their own soundtrack. From the grunts, clicks, and purrs of reef fish to the crackling sound of snapping shrimp, healthy reefs are alive with the sound of music. This symphony of sound is composed of calls to communicate, attract mates, and warn others of predators. And marine creatures rely on these reef soundtracks, or soundscapes, to understand their environment and make informed decisions about which reef to call home. So can we, like marine creatures, also use these underwater soundscapes to better understand the quality of marine habitats? Well, the answer is yes, probably. We know that different habitats will produce distinct soundscapes depending on what animals are there and how stressed out they are, the condition of the habitat, and even the climate. But how we use this information is still an area of growing research. What I want to know is can we use underwater soundscapes to monitor the recovery of restored habitats. Can soundscapes be used to help us assess whether habitat restoration was successful? Marine restoration efforts are increasing globally, both in size and in number. And conservation organizations leading these efforts need to monitor recovery to know if the projects were successful. But current monitoring methods, mainly done on scuba, are expensive and very time intensive. And too often, long-term monitoring just isn't financially possible. I think using underwater soundscapes from restored reefs could present a cost-effective and efficient way of monitoring whether marine life has returned to these sites. And right now, in Australia, we have the perfect opportunity to test this. The Nature Conservancy, a global environmental not-for-profit, is leading Australia's largest marine restoration initiative to bring back shellfish reef ecosystems from the brink of extinction. Since 2016, they have restored 12 hectares of shellfish reef in Port Phillip Bay alone, an area equivalent to six Melbourne cricket grounds. So we can test if we can use soundscapes to assess biodiversity at these restored sites by taking sound recordings both before and after shellfish reefs are built and from restored shellfish reefs of different ages to learn how components of the soundscapes change over time. Now, this is bigger than restoration in Port Phillip Bay. It's bigger than Australia, even. If we can use this research to develop a cost-effective tool for monitoring marine biodiversity, this will be a game changer for people working to conserve and restore marine ecosystems around the world. Affordable long-term monitoring means that projects can be monitored for longer and more often, and more money can be spent on putting more reefs in the water. This also means projects are better able to adapt if things are not looking successful, improving how marine restoration is done. Overall, a better return on investment. So a vote for my pitch is a vote to help the people on the ground working to protect and restore threatened marine ecosystems in Australia and around the world. 
Wow, Emily, what, a, what an amazing idea, listening to the sounds. It makes me think of being a kid and spending my summers snorkelling and listening to all the kind of pings and sounds under the water. Um, but we've got a fantastic question for you from Julian. And Julian wants to know how anthropogenic noises interfere with your research and how you actually perceive the soundscapes that you're interested in. Uh, yeah, that is an excellent question. Um, because we are putting a lot of sounds um, into the marine environment um, through boat traffic, um, marine construction, all these things do interfere with the sounds that the natural soundscapes um, on the reefs. Um, so there has been research that shows that the sound of a, 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 a motorboat driving by a coral reef will interfere with uh, mating behavior or even survival of fish. Uh, so we don't have all the answers yet for how um, sound pollution is interfering with the marine environment, but we do know that it, it's an issue um, and that's an ongoing area of research for sure. And presumably something we have no hope of getting rid of, so you have to work out how to take it into account. Yeah, for sure. And it depends what, you know, what um, is causing the noise pollution as well. So, you know, different frequencies will travel different distances. So understanding, um, you know, what is out there and what the impacts are and how we can maybe mitigate them um, rather than eliminating completely is our best option. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I've got a great question here from Griffin Srednik. Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. What is the sound indicator for a healthy oyster reef? What's it meant to sound like? Uh, um, that's a good question as well, um, and that's uh, part of you know why we want to do this research is we don't know exactly. Um, so if you do hear a recording from a degraded reef, um, it's pretty quiet. Um, and if you hear sound from a healthier reef, um, like you heard on the beginning of my, my video, that there's lots of noise. Mm -hmm. But can we, my question is, can we look, can we tell more than just, you know, degraded and healthy? Can we find the, you know, a threshold of what, what is a healthy reef or fine tune it a bit more than that? So can we tell what stage of recovery a reef is at based on the soundscape? Um, but, you know, we don't know exactly how to do that yet. So there are different indic indices that we can look at in the sound recordings and try to understand what what makes a healthy reef. What an amazing proposition that different sounds could indicate, you know, at what stage of recovery a reef is. I think it's Hopefully. just fascinating. Uh, our next question is, how do you capture and assess the soundscapes? Um, so we have um, hydrophones, which are underwater sound recorders, um, and you can deploy them in the water and the great thing is you can leave them out for uh, in long periods. So currently our methods of surveying are done by scuba divers doing uh, visual surveys or deploying cameras um, and again assessing visually the fish. So um, those are those have limitations. They're really great but they've got limitations. Mm -hmm. You can only you know be out there for as long as a diver can be underwater or you know the length of a camera battery. So these Hydrophones, um, some of them you can leave out for months at a time um, so you can collect data throughout the day and night so you can get soundscapes through a 24-hour period. You can leave them out there for you know months at a time. You can look at patterns um, throughout the lunar cycle and through seasonal patterns to see we can really assess how the communities are changing over time. So I think up until... 1980s or something. Um, hydrophones are really only used by the military, so they're really expensive. Um, but because of advances in, in technology, they're uh, much more widely available and affordable now. So it it's, you know, really opens up opportunities to use them for, for research. I just love the idea of listening to what's going on down there. It's just wonderful, Emily. Thank you so much for your work and for your fantastic pitch tonight. I, I just really have no idea how the judges are going to do their job. But enormous thank you to Emily and to Cheek and to Ellen and, of course, to all of our pitchers this evening. You've now heard from our five pitchers. So it's time for me to hand back to Moira, 
whose judging team I think has a pretty tricky job ahead of them. Good luck, Moira and team. Thanks, Jen. You are absolutely right. Um, thank you to all of tonight's pitchers. There is such a huge amount of talent in the room here. And each of you have presented a thorough and exciting project that will have a lasting impact. As the Dean, I am delighted to see so many fresh ideas coming from the Faculty of Science and to be able to lend my support to these emerging academics. The future of science is indeed bright. Now, just before the judges and I head off to deliberate a task that will not be easy, I would like to introduce Dr. Ileana Mendina Guzman, who took out last year's top prize. So I'll now pass over to Ileana as she reflects on last year's big science pitch and how her work has advanced. Ileana. Thank you, Moira. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, Russ actually asked me earlier about what has been happening with that. And I thought there were two things that were really um, valuable for me from the whole process of, of last year. One of them was the, the very um, concept of preparing the pitch and, and the training that we received. And so I don't know for those at home if it's evident, but these pitches have been prepared for a while. So it's not improvised anything. Um, we've been crafting these with the help of awesome people like Jen, like Tim, like Ben. And that whole process was super enlightening for me. I really enjoyed that and I learned a lot. Um, and the second thing, obviously, the funding, um, which I'm super grateful for. Um, so the pitch that I, the, the project that I pitched last year was about um, nest architecture and how birds can modify their nests or whether they can modify their nests to um, rapidly adapt to, to changing conditions in climate and basically protect their eggs from um, warmer environments. And um, well, the funds are being used right now um, to, to uh, hire field assistants that are right now looking for nests in, in Canberra and trying to collect data that will eventually reveal uh, what's the capacity of this, these birds to adjust to changing temperature. So I'm really super grateful and this is something that we wouldn't have been able to do um, without uh, this fund. So the whole experience overall was, was fantastic for me. Thank you, Ileana, for sharing your reflections on your work and experience. I can honestly say since learning about your work last year, I certainly look at birds' nests in a different light with a, a much greater appreciation of their precision and their, uh, their architecture. But most importantly, they're mathematical beauty. I mean, they, they're really fascinating. But it's now time for the judges to go off and decide who wins one of the multiple prizes. So I'll hand back to you, Jen. Thanks. Thank you, Moira and judges. Oh my gosh, good luck. I'm glad it's not me. So while we're waiting for our judges to make some tough decisions, I've got some excellent trivia questions for you prepared by our pitchers, um, just to check how well you've been listening to our pitchers this evening. But just before we start with our trivia questions, it's now time for you to vote for the People's Choice Award. You re remember, you get to decide who wins our $10,000 People's Choice Award. So please check the chat so you can see the link and register your vote. And you can submit your vote anytime during the next five minutes or so while we do uh, our trivia questions. But once we finish trivia, that is the end of your voting time. So don't wait for too long. But now it is time to get your thinking caps on because we are going to do some trivia. So we are going to share each question with you as a poll on the screen. And our first question is from Ellen and I'm very excited to hear your responses. So the question is that if smooth newts are allowed to spread outside of Melbourne, where are they projected to spread to? And as you can see, your choices are first to Queensland, second to Northern Australia, third to Southern Australia, and finally to Tasmania. So I'm just going to give you a small amount of time, 20 seconds, 30 seconds maybe, to think about your answer. So go back to, I think, pretty sure Ellen had a map. Maybe you can picture that in your minds. So Queensland, 
Northern Australia, Southern Australia or Tasmania. And we've got Amber working the magic for us. Amber, I reckon it is time to see how well everybody listened. So let's have a look at our results. All right, oh my gosh, you guys have clearly been listening well. We have 81% of people who have correctly remembered that it is Southern Australia that we are worried about. So Ellen, you can be very convinced that everyone was listening carefully. All right, time for our second question, this time from Jin Yu. And the question is, what will Jin Yu use to control the aphids without having to resort to pesticides? Is it bacteria? Is it natural enemies? Is it fungi or is it washing powder? I'm guessing that not many of you are gonna go with the washing powder option here. So I don't think I'm gonna to need to give you too long for this one. Bacteria, natural enemies, fungi or washing powder. Amber, who has been busily working the chat all night. Amber, let's see what our audience decided for this one. Uh, there you go, 90% of our audience remembered that it is all about bacteria. Nice work. All right, time to move on to our third question. And this one is from Cheek. And the question is that a fly smells with its antennae and we heard amazing things about insect antennae, but how does it taste? So is an insect tasting with its mouth parts? with its legs, with its maxillary palp, which as far as I can remember, palps are a bit like antennae, but they come off kind of around the mouth rather than on the top of the head, the abdomen or all of the above. Oh, I think this is a pretty tricky one. We'll have to see, Amber, how well people remember what Cheek was talking about. So mouth parts, legs, maxillary palps, abdomen or all of the above. Let's have a look at your responses. I'm excited to see what's coming up. Oh, there you go. So this one has split our audience a little bit more. A few mouth parts, a few more legs, quite a lot of maxillary um, palps. And in fact, 53% of you were correct in saying that in fact, it is all of the above. Nice work, those of you who, uh, who came up with that answer. All right, our fourth question is from Emily. And Emily's question is, what is the area of shellfish reef that has been restored in Port Phillip Bay? And I love the fact that Emily has given us answers in MCG sizes, Melbourne Cricket Ground sizes. So is it the equivalent of one MCG or three MCGs or six MCGs or in fact the equivalent of 12 Melbourne cricket grounds. That is quite a lot. The MCG is clearly quite big. So I will give you a few more seconds and as you can see Amber's just put in the chat please if you haven't already do vote for the People's Choice Award because it is your choice. But let's have a look at the correct answer to Emily's question. Let's see how you went. I'm excited. There you go. So we're split again. We've got most people responding with 12 hectares, the equivalent of six MCGs. And that is in fact the correct answer. Nice work. All right. It is time for our final question from Justin's work. And the question is very clearly focused on exactly what Justin was talking about, which is what is coral bleaching? Your options are a deadly disease caused by bacteria or the loss of beneficial algae because of elevated water temperatures causing corals to starve and die. Your third option is that corals inject bleach into their lungs to cure themselves of COVID-19. I feel like I should just not go there with that one. Or your last option is a process by which corals release greenhouse gases and cause climate change. Justin has put in some pretty tricky answers there for you all, but I'm confident that our audience is pretty cluey. So let's see what you thought coral bleaching was. 
Let's have a look, Amber. Oh, there you go. Almost everybody, so 94% of people, agree that it's the loss of beneficial algae because of elevated water temperatures causing corals to starve and die. Well done. I'm very impressed with all of the responses to the trivia questions. Very nicely done. I'm going to give you maybe 10 more seconds to put in your answer for the People's Choice Award. So please, if you haven't done it yet, think back to our five brilliant pitches this evening. Think about the problems they're trying to solve and the solutions that they pitch to you about how they are going to try and solve these problems. All right, I think your time is now up. I can't wait to see the results of the People's Choice Award. But I have just been told that our judges have returned with their decision. Um, I'm very impressed they managed to do that so quickly. So it's time for me to hand back to Moira to find out who our winners are going to be this evening. Take it away, Moira. Thanks, Jen. We have indeed conferred and it was a very lively and robust discussion. And it's been a really difficult task to pick who the winners are because the projects are so diverse and they are all excellent. All have a great underpinning of science and all are, will make an impact, all are worthy of funding. So, you know, well done to absolutely everyone. In awarding the prizes, we looked for a combination of innovation in approach, the possible impact of the work, and the general quality, flair, and delivery of the pitches. There was a lot of flair in all of them, so all did very well in that category. Tonight's prizes were made possible thanks to the generous donations to the Native Australian Animals Trust and through Robert Johansson and Anne Swan Funds. Without further ado, I'm now going to pass over to Ileana, then Andrew and Russell to announce the prizes. Thank you. So for our third prize, our third place, um, our winner was Xin Yu is going to fight pests with bacteria. Congratulations. Um, and we just thought this project um, on your pitch was fantastic, but it, it has a really great applied value. And we think it could be really impactful in terms of um, you know, the, the impact on agriculture. So congratulations to you. And now, Russ, you can tell us. Second. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. They were all really fantastic. And it was difficult to decide. But in second place, we've gone with Cheek for his uh, research into the uh, insects and how they're affected by the bushfire events. So we thought it was really novel and, and unique research and sounds really exciting. So congratulations. And over to Andrew. Thanks, Russell. So, yep, privileged to announce the number one prize, which went to Elling, Ellen Cottingham. Well done. Anybody could have won it. Uh, but, you know, great effort there, Ellen. Um, we thought um, after much debate that this was an urgent problem, uh, this was an innovative approach to solving an urgent problem, and that invasive species are inclined to get away, and then when they're, they've gone, they're impossible to bring back, like deer. We also thought that your bio had shown uh, the ability to deliver, deliver practical outcomes already from your research, so that was definitely a plus two. Congratulations. Over to you, Moira. Congratulations to all of our pitchers this evening. It has been a very, very enjoyable evening and we've enjoyed hearing about all of your work and I'm sure for those watching at home, there's a huge amount of talent and passion. You'll see there's a huge amount of talent and passion and acumen in the room. I would like to thank again our judging panel for their deliberations this evening. Uh, thank you for taking the time for joining me in what proved to be a difficult task given the calibre of people who were presenting for our audience. I hope you have enjoyed hearing about the five new research projects proposed by our early career researchers. Each pitch has shown what can be achieved when we focus on Australian native animals and their environments. So I'm now gonna hand back to Jen Martin who will announce the Winton's Choice and the People's Choice Awards. Thank you, Moira. What a wonderful thing it is to hear all of your reflections on our pictures and their work. 
And it is now my pleasure to present the Tim Winton Award. Tim is currently deep out in the bush and sadly isn't able to join us live this evening, but he has watched all of the pictures uh, and he did send me a message to read to you this evening. So let me read you these words from Tim Winton. I'd like to congratulate all of the shortlisted researchers. Every one of these was a great idea that I'd really like to see supported. Each of them addresses urgent and interesting fields of inquiry, from food safety and crop protection to innovative solutions to invasive species and aiding the resilience of corals, as well as studying the huge challenges faced by insects in the Anthropocene. They're all about finding ways to protect Australia's precious native animals, and they were all very well pitched. But my job, was to pick only one, and that hasn't been easy. So I've picked the weirdest one, because if it works, it could have very fruitful and practical outcomes in monitoring the health of restored marine habitats. My vote goes to Emily Fobert's idea for soundscape monitoring. Congratulations, Emily. Pretty nice to know that Tim's been listening to all these pictures and thinking about how amazing all of your work is. We have one award left and it's probably my favourite, no offence to the judges, but it's wonderful to hear what you, our audience, thinks and what you've taken away from the pictures this evening. So I think it's the most exciting award. And my understanding is that this year, once again, it was very, very, very close with only a couple of votes separating our top two favourites. But I'm really pleased to announce that our People's Choice winner for the 2022 Big Science Pitch is Justin. <laughs> Woohoo! Wow, I feel like the money has been very nicely shared this evening without without any prior planning at all. So uh, very well done audience and judges and Tim Winton. What a wonderful outcome for our really incredible uh, early career researchers who, as you've seen, are all doing very extraordinary science. So that just about brings our big science pitch to a close for this year. But of course, I have some thank yous. Before I come to the thank yous though, I'd really like to congratulate our five pitchers again, Jin Yu, Justin, Ellen, Cheek and Emily, first of all for being selected to be part of this event, but also for just doing such a brilliant job with their pitchers and also the Q&A sessions that they did with me. I would really like to thank our wonderful judging panel. Thank you, Moira, Ileana, Russ and Andrew for the time that you've spent in fisticuffs uh, discussing, arguing who our winners would be tonight. I really want to thank all of the Faculty of Science events team, especially Amber and Erin and Daryl, and of course, all of the talented crew here in the studio with us this evening for helping tonight uh, to come together so well. And I must say, it was a lot more fun this year being in a studio with all of these people than sitting on my own last year on Zoom. So I'm delighted that that could happen uh, this evening. Massive thanks to Professor Tim Dempster, who's put in a huge amount of work behind the scenes to make this evening happen. And of course, a very, very warm thank you to the Native Australian Animal Trust for the very generous prize money and for supporting our up and coming research superstars. Obviously, we couldn't do this event without you. So congratulations, everybody. What a wonderful evening. And with or without thunderstorms, I'm very confident that we will be back again next year in 2023 for another big science pitch. So thank you so much to you, our audience, for joining us. We're so thrilled that you could be here. Thank you for all your wonderful questions and for your votes. And well done for your great trivia answers. And good night.